Good evening. How is everyone? Good. It's great to see you again. Um, this is really our final Krasno event for this semester. As you know, I uh, announced before that the last one was a final event, but then it was possible to have a special additional event on Hong Kong. And of course, we would love to hear uh, our distinguished speaker today, Alessandro Reyes, to talk to us about Hong Kong. Um, I would like to remind you that we have a YouTube channel and during the holidays when you may get bored and you've got nothing to do, please re uh, remember our YouTube channel. We have had 84 events since 2012 with ha uh, over 110 speakers, so that can keep you very busy during the holiday season. Also we have a, a, a website, uh, krasnoevents.com. And on that website, you will soon find information on the new program for our next semester, maybe after Christmas, I would say. Um, but I can tell you that the first event next semester will take place on the 16th of January here in this uh, very room at 5.30 p.m. I'm Klaus Laris, and I'm the Richard M. Krasner Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. As you may have noticed, this is a very important day in world history today and this week. Uh, articles of impeachment were filed today for the first time, uh, for the fourth time in the nation's history. Then we also had the one year anniversary of the arrest of two Canadian citizens in China, which uh, something people have called hostage diplomacy, because it has, of course, something to do with the arrest of the chief financial officer for Huawei in, uh, in Canada. Then in two days' time we have the British elections and the fate of Brexit probably will be decided in a few days' time once we know the outcome of that election. And yesterday Ukraine and Russia signed some sort of agreement about what to do about eastern Ukraine. And hopefully that will at least uh, get us a little closer to a solution for eastern Ukraine. And all of these events about Russia, China, Britain and many others, we try to cover here in the Krasno event series. And some of them will be covered uh, next um, semester and next uh, year. We have a few, uh, actually quite a few, distinguished speakers in our audience today. Not just distinguished speakers, distinguished uh, people. There's above all Ambassador Sasser, who used to be American um, uh, ambassador to China during the Clinton years. And he was also three-time senator for Tennessee. Then we have Kaiser Ku, who is one of the nation's best experts on China. And it was Kaiser who facilitated today's uh, speaker, because he knows him very well and suggested that he would come and talk to us. And then we have, of course, our distinguished speaker, who will be introduced in a, min in a minute. But we also have another distinguished uh, person in the audience, that is our senior associate dean, uh, for s the social sciences and global programs, that is uh, Professor Rudy Colorado Mansfeld. And Rudy will introduce uh, the speaker in a minute. Um, but uh, I would like to emphasize how important Rudy is because Rudy and his college gives us most of the money for running this <laughs> series. And talking about money, let me use the opportunity and remember that there is Christmas. And if you wish to make a Christmas gift to the Krasno event series, we are very grateful for any donations. Perhaps you feel the, the, the holiday spirit in you already. So please uh, remember us. Uh, we need your help to uh, support this series, to be able to uh, have another 84 events in the very near future. So for, uh, in a minute, uh, Rudy will uh, introduce our speaker, then uh, Alessandro Reyes will give his talk here at the podium, and then Alessandro and I will move to uh, these chairs and have a bit of a panel discussion. And then, of course, the most important part of the event will take place when we open it up to Q&A from you, the audience. And I hope you will, as always, have very interesting, lively and engaged questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Colorado Munson to introduce the speaker. Uh, thank you, Klaus. It's great to be here. And uh, I get to do one of these introductions about once a year. So uh, I will always do the same thing, which is to plug this event series and, in fact, this community. This is um, a singular 
uh, activity on this campus to have a forum of global affairs, a forum where we can regularly host uh, diplomats and statespeople. And it is distinctive how large this community has grown. I know it feels cozy tonight, but for goodness sake, we're in the middle of exams on a rainy Tuesday afternoon, and we still have 30 to 40 people in a room. There's no other lecture series on campus that has this kind of loyalty uh, and this thoughtful an audience that comes to it regularly. Uh, so this is, a, this is very important to me in my role as the Senior Associate Dean for Global Programs. It's very important to the university. It runs on a shoestring. It runs on Klaus's creativity. It runs on whatever networks all of you have in this room. And it's running very well. So we, this will be a place that we keep uh, trying to build and support. Uh, so it is a real pleasure for me to be able to uh, introduce Alejandro Reyes uh, to you this evening. Uh, Alejandro Reyes is an associate professor and director of knowledge dissemination at the Asia Global Institute, a think tank at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, Professor Reyes manages Asia Global Online, the institute's digital journal that provides Asian perspectives on global issues. Prior to joining the Institute, he was for two years Senior Policy Advisor to the Assistant Deputy for Asia Pacific and Co-Convener of the Asia Pacific Policy Hub at Global Affairs Canada. And from 2007 to 2017, he was an Associate Professor in the Department of Politics and Public Administration mm -hmm. at Hong Kong University. Uh, for many years, he was a Hong Kong-based independent consultant. That was from 2001 to 2017, uh, where he worked with several foundations and international organizations, uh, including the Clinton Global Initiative, the, um, the World Economic Forum, and U.S. Asia Institute, as well as a variety of, of corporate clients. Uh, he began his professional career as a journalist uh, with Asia Week magazine, which is part of Time Incorporated, where he worked from 1988 to 2001 in Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, he was born in the Philippines. He's a citizen of Canada. And he's educated at Harvard University and the University of Oxford, and has had, uh, held fellowships at Columbia University, Ohio University, and the Atlantic Council of the United States. And so here, a personal note. In 1985, Alejandro was a student at a boarding school in Massachusetts, two years ahead of me. And there was a dark, cold night where I snuck into the back of the chapel at that university to try to read Sartre's Les Jeux Sans Fait for my French class because I had put it off for so long and I was desperate and I was hiding from people trying to read that book. Alejandro came up to me in the back of the chapel and he said, this is a curious place to be reading French existential philosophy. And at that point, I knew I was doubly screwed because I didn't understand the text and I did not understand why this would be a curious place to be reading it. <laughs> So that was also a moment of insight for me because I now knew that whatever was going on in this book was somehow at odds with the Christian ethics that was embodied in that building. And I went from, from there. So uh, it's a great pleasure for me to have Professor Reyes here tonight because I have always found him a source of insight even if I have not always been able to follow exactly what was going on. So please join me in welcoming Professor Reyes. Thank you very much, uh, Rudy, um, and thank you very much, uh, HNO, for coming. Uh, it's a really a pleasure uh, for me to be here. Um, I have to say, uh, reminded of that story, which is sort of in the haze of my memory, just makes me feel uh, how old I am. <laughs> That's some time ago now. I, I, I think I must have been like 16 or 17. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you very much all for coming, especially with the weather the way it is. Um, I always enjoy coming to North Carolina. Um, believe it or not, I come to North Carolina at least twice a year, uh, although I go to Charlotte <laughs> and not to around Durham. The last time I was here in Durham was uh, 1982 for my second brother's graduation from Duke. And sadly, I have not been here since, but I am making amends by, by coming here today. So thank you very much. 
Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I'm sure most of you have been following the news of Hong Kong, and um, it fills your, uh, your television sets, and you read a lot about what's happening. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do, focus on here today, is to try to give a sense of some things that you may not know about what's going on. I mean, you probably know that uh, the protests started because uh, the government, the Hong Kong government, tried to uh, put through so-called anti, um, sorry, uh, the extradition amendment uh, legislation. They wanted to amend the existing extradition framework in Hong Kong so that it would allow extradition of fugitives from Hong Kong to the mainland and to Taiwan and Macau. And that decision was uh, controversial, for one thing, because Hong Kong um, has not had that framework uh, before to allow fugitives to extradite to, to the mainland. But what probably caused more problem was uh, the government tried to ram this legislation through. So they introduced it in April, and they wanted to pass it by July. And they tried to bypass all sorts of consultations. Anyway, there, in some ways, the rest is history. That It generated a lot of discontent and street protests. And uh, you, you probably know most of the, the story so far. Let me just talk a bit about the phases of the, uh, of the protests. So we, we started out, there's a protest season in Hong Kong. It starts with usually a, in May, on May 4th. For, for reasons that we don't really understand related to uh, Chinese history. So um, May 4th, there's usually some kind of protest in, in Hong Kong. And then that we go on to June 4th. Again, if you think back to 1989, then there's another reason to have some kind of protest in Hong Kong. Then it moves on to July 1, which is the anniversary of um, Hong Kong's uh, return to Chinese sovereignty. And then that also creates opportunity for protests. Well, in Hong Kong, that, you know, we've always had street protests. For, I mean, even under the British, so, I mean, it's a quite a, a common thing. But, but it, it, there is that season. And then, of course, once you get to July, and then you have the hot days, humid days of summer. But it, 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 you then go on till 1st uh, of October. 1st of October, the anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China, usually again, there's a protest. So there's that period of protests. Now, initially, because the uh, legislation, uh, the extradition legislation was introduced in April, it just set everything up for May 4th to be a, a, a day where the people would go out on the streets. The protests were generally quite peaceful uh, to start. Now, as it happened, I, I just come back uh, from Canada after two years working in the Canadian Foreign Ministry. My first day, uh, back working at the University of Hong Kong was the 2nd of May. So just right in time to uh, witness what's going on. And what I tried to do, just as a, an academic, just as a former journalist, is to actually go to all the protests. Um, I think I can say this because I used to be a journalist, but I, I don't trust the media. So uh, I feel like I need to see things for myself. Right? And, and I think this is particularly true with the protests uh, so far, at least, because I think that the, the media, particularly media from the United States, has gotten quite wrapped into the whole drama of it and has focused very much on the valiant protests and then the brutality of the police. And it's been a, a very, um, I wouldn't say one-sided, but a very narrow perspective, I think, that you're getting. And of course, you know, it's all about the evil Chinese and the you know, Beijing trying to suppress freedoms. I mean, it's very, I mean, there, 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 there's truth, but there's also uh, many different layers to it. But I don't think many of the layers of this story uh, get seen. Now, the first phase was really peaceful demonstrations. So, uh, you heard about uh, the day we had a million people on the street, supposedly. Now, uh, I was there. Uh, maybe it was a million, but I think it was probably a bit less. But you know, I don't think it matters the number. But a lot of people in Hong Kong. If you think about a population being seven million people, if you have about a million, it's, it's a significant amount of population. 
The next week, we had two million people panicking on the street. I think, again, it was probably less than that. But again, a significant uh, amount of uh, people. And then you got st um, steadily more and more sort of clashes, violent clashes between the protesters and the police. But it started quite early on. This is something that I think is very important to understand. That from the very beginning, I remember on June 12th it was, I was in front of the legislative council, the legislature. And it was about noon time, and I was just watching what was going on. And I just saw the police um, gathering around the gates of the legislature and also at the, near the office of the chief executive. And I just thought, there's going to be tear gas. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I, I had this sense. And sure enough, you know, there was a, a, that, the, the police used tear gas right on that day. And there were the police um, reaction to uh, the protesters trying to get into the country. It was quite, quite strong. I wouldn't say brutal, but I mean, it was a very, um, it was a very uh, rough sort of response to what the uh, protesters were trying to do. Contrast that with five years earlier, which is really very important. Five years earlier, as you recall, we had the so-called Occupy protests in, in, in Hong Kong, which closed down three sections of three areas of Hong Kong protesters occupied it for 79 days. Aside from the initial tear gassing on that first day of that protest, the police response was generally quite mild, if I can put it that way. But here, it was very obvious, police reaction was very strong indeed. And um, I remember texting one of my students. So I taught uh, for 10 years at the University of Hong Kong, if I went to Ottawa. So I have about 2,500 former students. It sounds like a lot, but I only really keep in touch with about 20, 25 of them. So I usually go to the protests, and I bring one of them to be my bodyguard. <laughs> because you know, I don't run fast enough these days. <laughs> and, um, and, and I, 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 but I text students just to ask them you know, what, What's their sense? What are they? Because there's always a theme for them in these protests. I right? understand what's the thinking behind this mother protest. And I remember texting one of my students who happened to not be there, but he was uh, in Japan. And I said, you know, and this is really early on, June 12, I said that the police are really responding very tough, a very tough man. And he said, yes, he noticed that too. And that became the hallmark of the response of the police. And I think this is driving a lot of the anger that you see in the streets. And it's part of the reason why we have this protest movement that keeps on going. It's, you know, you think it's going to wind down, but it then steps up, and particularly violence steps up. And why? Because I think there's a lot of anger because of the response of the police. The police um, really, a tough response, I wouldn't say, you know, it, it, to the point that you see a, a, in the age of social media, a lot of the brutality that you see gets magnified. And so every single bit of um, tough response from the police is broadcast all over the world. Even if it's just one, and you've probably all seen the video of uh, the poor kid who got shot, uh, which again, you know, that one instant just gets repeated and magnified. Now, I'm not saying that the police did this in any way to excuse the police, but I'm trying to, uh, my, my point is that one of the reasons why six months, and six months now on, that the protests are going strong is because there is that anger against the police brutality. We moved on to a second phase. I would say after the um, uh, July, when, when you saw, I, I'm sure most of you saw the video of uh, protesters entering the legislature and trashing the legislature. So I was actually there. I wasn't in the legislature, but I was right on the gate. And, um, uh, and, and it was interesting to see, um, it was almost like they couldn't believe that they managed to do that. Now think about if that had happened at the Capitol Hill, if protesters had managed to get into the chamber of the House of Representatives of the Senate and have done what they did, um, what would have happened? In this case, there was hardly any 
violence. There was essentially some tear gas to remove the uh, protesters later. But so again, my point here is to say that whilst the police response has been very strong and some would say brutal, compared to what might be possible and compared to police response in, say, what, what we've seen in Chile, what we've seen in Lebanon, what seen, where there have been significant number of uh, casualties. In Hong Kong, there's really been only one uh, casualty related to uh, the protests. And that's actually of a pro-police, pro-China pro uh, person, individual, who was hit by a protester with a stone. There was one other uh, death, um, which was of a young student, a 20-year-old student at the University of Science and Technology, who fell while fleeing from the police. Now, the protesters will say that there are many more deaths, but something like 20, 25. But um, some of these additional uh, casualties, they're, they're, they're all generally thought to be suicides. Uh, because you have to think again about, and I'll, I'll my, my talk about this later, the, the mental anguish of this protest that uh, many of the young people feel. And we're talking about really young, young people who are the youngest person who's been arrested so far is 11 years old. So uh, uh, I would say about uh, half, according to surveys, about half the protesters are in their 20s. More than half of the protesters are in their 20s. About 10% are under 20 years old, 10%. Um, so um, many of them secondary school students who, um, you know, want, I think it's a good question to ask whether they fully understand some of the issues that they're, they're uh, protesting on the street about. Now, uh, so you have the initial phase of peace, generally peaceful protests, large numbers, then a second phase of a greater violence, if you will, on the part of the protesters, and then greater violence in terms of response from the police. And then you had, uh, a, then we got, we got into what you've seen a phase with, with that you've uh, seen doubtless in the last few weeks, middle of November, where the violence got to a point where uh, university campuses suddenly became the arena for these pitched battles, and the level of violence really got to a, a significant level. Uh, the focus was on uh, three universities. Um, Polytechnic University, which is probably the one that you uh, read about the most, which was really trashed to the point that um, it will take about six months to repair this university to get it back functioning. Chinese University of Hong Kong, which is quite famous, but it, it, it's a sprawling campus, so that became a kind of arena for, for um, uh, clashes between police and protesters. And then two urban uh, universities, Hong Kong Baptist, uh, sorry, Hong Kong Baptist and uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic are both urban universities, and then in another more sprawling campus, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Now here's a story that I don't think anybody in the media has reported. What happened at Hong Kong U, and I think the lesson of what happened at Hong Kong U, or the lessons that we can draw from Hong Kong U, um, uh, might give us a sense of whether, you know, the question that, that the title of this uh, talk can there be a peaceful solution? Hong Kong U was never occupied or shut off by the protesters, unlike the other universities. The protesters came, they occupied parts of the campus, they blocked streets, they blocked the main road outside the campus, the access to the campus, but they never blocked, entirely blocked the access. Why? In large part because the senior management of the university maintained communications with them throughout the whole episode. While there was a lot of tension on the Kowloon side in those universities I mentioned, Hong Kong U, there was communication. The senior management was out there <coughs> talking to the protesters, different people, including mental health experts and conflict prevention experts went out to communicate with the students. And there was communications with the police because it's a, 
it was very important that the police not enter the campus. In Hong Kong, there's a strong um, principle in terms of you know, what, well, what all the universities are what we call government subvented institutions. Um, not, not quite state institutions, but they're supported by the government. Um, but the, but the um, principle, guiding principle in terms of law and order on campus is that uh, that's usually left to the universities themselves and the internal security, like you have the campus police. Uh, but that the police can only enter campuses if they're responding to a, a 911, we call a 999 call, or uh, chasing a fugitive, a suspect. Otherwise, police stay away. Now, there was much expectation, as happened at Chinese U and at Poly, that the police would come in to try to neutralize the protests. But at Hong Kong U, the management communicated with the police, and there was essentially some kind of coming together that the protesters would remain calm, the police wouldn't enter, and the situation eventually would resolve. Now, it wasn't resolved without some tension. And again, this is very instructive, okay, because at one point, there was a need to unblock the road because the road outside Hong Kong U is the passage between a residential area where there are a lot of elderly people and one of the biggest hospitals in Hong Kong. Now, if, if you can think about it, if you think about it, the longer that kind of that road is blocked, the more difficult it is for elderly people needing regular health care to get to the hospital. And that was becoming a, 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 an urgent matter. The university communicated with uh, the protesters and said, we need to clear the road. There were three agreements. Each time, the clearing failed. The protesters changed their mind. Then pro-police, pro-China uh, uh, groups said, we're going to come and we're going to open the road. And as you can imagine, we had, we had meetings late into the night worried about what would happen. They had said that they would come on Saturday afternoon, three in the afternoon, and there would potentially be clashes. Because by this time, middle of November, you're seeing all over Hong Kong, pro-democracy, pro-China, fighting on the streets. I mean, just if they disagree with each other, they might. Uh, you, you, you've seen the video of the um, pro-China uh, gentleman who was set on fire. I think you might have seen that one because he was berating the protesters and set on fire. Uh, I think he, he, he survived in, in the hospital. But in any case, um, we, we had this nightmare scenario of pro-China groups, pro-democracy groups, suddenly uh, coming to blows over the clearing of the streets. So they, the pro-China groups turned out. The protesters started throwing things at them. But then something, again, we hadn't really seen happen. Residents, people who are probably not on, on, not on one side or the other, but people from the area came out and they started clearing up the streets. The numbers grew to the point that the protesters just stopped and let it happen, let the clearing happen. At one point, a police van happened to come by and the protesters thought, here it is. The police are going to come and invade the campus that they've been uh, sort of occupying. And they started throwing bricks at the police van. Police van stopped. It turned out the police van was just going from one place to the other. But it stopped, and the police came out. And there was potential to, 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 for, for there to be a, a clash that we've been trying to avoid. But then, again, because the senior management of the university was taking ownership of the situation, the deans, they were out there. They just raised their hands and said, don't. You know, they prevented the police from uh, reacting to what the students had done. The situation calmed. The police went on their way. The streets were cleared. And the campus was restored to peace. What we found when we de-weaponized the campus was 3,500 Molotov cocktails. Right? And in Poly U, there were 4,500 of them. It's a whole uh, production line of Molotov cocktails 
there was corrosive uh, liquids all I, it, it was quite uh, a sight but again um, I think the lesson from this episode that it has not been reported as far as I know in media is that if there's communication with the young people with the protesters about what they're protesting about what they what what their issues are but also what their concerns first concerns are then it's possible to have some kind of political solution. One of our deans, dean of architecture, he actually had a one-on-one -on -one confrontation with a protester, 14-year-old kid, all in black and mask, with long talk cocktail about it, thinking about lighting it, lobbying. And he just talked to him and said, well, what is your favorite subject in school? What, you know, uh, how do you feel with, with your parents? Or do they know what your, uh, all of those questions. And the, the, you know, <coughs> the way uh, Chris described it was a, you, know, you can see the glistening in the eyes through the mask. And eventually he left the Molotov cocktail down. The dean took it and brought it off. And he convinced the, the kid to go home. Now, I'm not saying that you know, this is the way that will lead to some peace, but there are three things about this protest that make it difficult to resolve, where, you know, frankly, I don't really see any real exit ramps at the moment. The three things are the lessons that the protesters say they learned from Occupy protest five years ago. One is that leaderless works. Because if you have a leadership structure, the authorities can just arrest the leaders and neutralize the move. Now, the second thing is unity is everything. And they feel that so long as they're unified, they can get something. What they learned from five years ago was that because they didn't have unity, they got nothing. They didn't get anything. And the third thing is don't criticize other parts of the movement, even if you don't agree with it. That's why I've had a situation where I confront my students and say, you guys are peaceful people. Why are you not out there telling the violent protesters to, to cool it? And they say, well, because what we learned was we, we, we have to be unified, and we cannot criticize. We accept. Uh, in, in, in the sense that, you know, I, I, again, this is one of this is a social media movement because they organize on platforms like Telegram and Reddit, and then they, they, people suggest protest action and the votes on it. it, it it's, it's quite kind of um, I want to say Lord of the Ringy, uh, ring, uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, Lord of the Flies, um, uh, kind of way of operating. But there, there is a bit of that, right? Now, um, that makes it difficult for the government to say, well, if we want to have dialogue with the protesters, whom do we talk to? I, now, I've come to the point, however, where I feel that's a bit of a cop-out. Because from my perspective, and the story of Hong Kong Yu suggests that it is possible, if you really want to do it, for the government to have some kind of dialogue with the students even if it's at a low level, even if it's just a, a group of a few. So what we've been trying to do at Hong Kong U, which again, this doesn't get uh, reported, uh, but colleagues of mine, and, now I live among the students. I live in a residential college of the University of Hong Kong. So I see the students all the time, and come 10 o'clock when they have the 10 in the evening uh, shouting protest, I can hear the shouts around me of all the slogans, right? Um, now, what we've start, started to do is have what we call family conversation. So we cannot, in this college, go up to a young person and say, are you a protester? We can't, right? We just assume they're just normal young people doing what they do, but we do know that many of them are out there on the streets of uh, every day and weekend. Now, one thing to, to understand about this research college is that it's, we have about 450 um, students in. More than, almost half are from the mainland. Right? Because if you think about it, 
a residential college, if you're a Hong Kong person, you're not living in a residential college. The mainlanders will. So we have to be sensitive to make sure this is a safe space for the mainlanders. Only about 95 of the 450 are local students. So we have to be concerned that the, the college remains a safe place even for, for, for everybody, including the mainlanders. But what we have been doing is having these family conversations. What's the purpose of them? I have to say, and this may be controversial to say, but part of the protest is a bit Trumpy, if I can use that <laughs> word. And I don't mean it in a flippant sort of way, but there is a nativist aspect of the protest that does not get much appreciation. And by nativist, I, 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 you know, the same way that you have it in the United States, the, concern about immigrants. Now, I'm not trying to say that it's racist, or I was having a discussion with Kaiser whether it's bigotry or not. You know, this is about Chinese, about other Chinese, right? And it's more about Hong Kong people worried about their culture, their identity, their way of life, even the kind of shops where they shop at that those things have changed. Concern about whether they can continue to use uh, Cantonese in, in daily life rather than Utongwa rather than Mandarin. And, and it, it's about identity right? and concern about erosion of that identity and their values. And it's, it locks into the questions about opportunity, about whether young people today have the same opportunities as their parents did. And it connects then to the housing issue. Is housing just too expensive for young people? You know, people aren't going to lob a Molotov cocktail just to pay low rent, right? <laughs> it, it, it's much more than that. And, and that's what I think, again, gets underappreciated in the media, is the coverage, is this idea that what you have is really concern about, <coughs> not just about democracy, but about Hong Kong identity and the search for it, and the sense that we have an identity. Um, and I say we because I've been living in Hong Kong uh, you know, 31 years on and off, so I feel very much part of the community. But that we have an identity, and we want to protect it, whether that means rule of law issues, whether that means voting, whether that means um, you know, uh, our education system, what have you. Now, I'm going to close because I realize that I've uh, uh, gone a bit over. Uh, I would just close uh, um, uh, 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 by, by saying this. In what is going to be the outlook? Right? As I said, I don't see any real exit ramps at the moment, and that concerns me. So the scenarios, there are many different scenarios, scenarios you can sort of conjure up. Um, just a, about a month or so ago, I was walking down from where I live up in the hill down to the uh, subway station near my apartment. And I was much distraught to see the entrances to the subway station being boarded up with metal sheets, really tough metal sheets. And I thought, I've never been to Belfast. I've never, I, I, I don't know what it was like to live there. But it suddenly conjured up that image to me that are we turning into a Belfast? Is that what the future might be if this protest continues, that we'll live in this situation where we're, we're having to um, armor our buildings against violence? So the, the MTR, our subway system, has sustained 250 million US dollars worth of damage, which the university, of, as I say, Polytechnic University, requires six months to repair. Um, so uh, that could happen. You could have a complete standoff. <coughs> the government could continue to do nothing, and it has really not done much. Yeah. Or we could have some kind of political solution. Could there be a peaceful solution? I think there could be one. But it requires that kind of conflict resolution communications that we did see in Hong Kong U, and that we're beginning to see in the community. I participated now in a community-wide conversation 
um, run by civil society groups. There was one that I missed that was uh, with youth groups. We're having those family conversations in the university. Uh, there are many, many others that are going on. And long may they continue because they will have to continue even if there is some kind of calm. We're now in a, in, in a bit of a lull at the moment because we had the district council elections and you saw a significant shift from the seats in the district councils being 75% controlled by pro-Beijing in, and independence to about the same, 75%, 80% controlled by pro-democracy. That's a huge, huge shift. Now, some people say that shows that the support for the protests is at what the protesters say, about 70, 80%, and that there's no silent majority in Hong Kong that wants, that supports the, the, the need for more democracy, but that doesn't support <laughs> violence. I, my, my argument is that the voters, the people who turned up, 70 plus percent of uh, the electorate who turned up, Un, unheard of in Hong Kong, usually 40 something, particularly for district councillors. That was the silent majority. That was, the, the, that was Hong Kong people like myself who said, we want to vote and show where we stand rather than be on the streets or rather than support the violence. Yes, there are folks who still support the protesters, even though there's violence, but I think the silent majority did show up. I would uh, just mention one last thing, is that there was a poll that I've seen done by an investor relations group um, that was probably the most professional poll uh, that I've seen. Uh, Hong Kong universities do some polling, but it's generally quite primitive. Um, but this polling was done very professionally with a large sample. It showed, and this was taken in October, it showed that 42% of the respondents supported the protests even with the violence. And that was the level of violence in October, before the big November blow up. Uh, the, the thinking is that that percentage has probably fallen below 40% since the big blow up in November. That's quite a bit lower than the protesters generally uh, say that the sort of force they have uh, today. So we have to be kind of realistic, and we have to be hopeful. And I think one possible hope is that you know, China offered five years ago a political reform package that would have allowed universal suffrage direct election of the chief executive, but with a nominating committee to vet candidates and choose two or three candidates. The nominating committee is allowed under Hong Kong's constitution. It's allowed under basic law, but it was not acceptable to the democracy candidate. And they essentially rejected it, which they can do, could do so in the legislature. And that whole reform package was taken away. There's a lot of regret about that. As a Hong Kong voter, I myself personally, I felt robbed of the opportunity to vote it, even if it was not perfect. You know, I think we let the perfect become the enemy of the good. And that had a lot of consequences, but it possibly meant that we would have had a, a different chief executive today uh, than we have right now. So I'll leave it at that. And then this was most interesting indeed. You certainly got a perspective we don't normally get from the media. What you said right at the beginning I found very interesting because you essentially said if police violence had been more restrained or not happened at all, or the police reaction had been more restrained, then by now the protest would have either petered out or would certainly not have been inflamed. Is that correct? It would certainly be qualitatively different because, uh, you know, again, I tried to uh, sit down with uh, some former students including people who are quite active. I mean, I, I, I have a couple of students who've been arrested, uh, but you know, there are about, about 6,000 people so far have been arrested, and the, uh, the, the charge rate on the arrest is only about 14%. So, you know, again, it, it, it's not as uh, significant. But, but yes, I, it, whenever I sit down with uh, students and, uh, and talk to some of the protesters, they always go back to, you know, this eye for an eye kind of 
mentality, I put that way, where the police started it. The police are violent, so we have every right to be violent. And then the police, then you said, well, then the, it means the police are more violent back. And then, well, then we, you know, so, so, the, so it is that kind of spiraling. I think if there had been a different response from the very beginning, um, we would be in a, possibly in a different place. So didn't the police at least partially recognize that? Didn't the chief executive realize that that, you know, that violence would begin violence? <clears throat> How shall I put this? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think that they should have realized it because five years earlier, on the very first day of the Occupy protest, there was tear gas. I know because I had just come out of the subway and like, that's tear gas, because I, I, I'd experienced tear gas in Italy, the long story, um, <laughs> before. And, and I, so I rushed back in and, and I said, like, it's so odd that they lobbed tear gas on the very first day of that protest. There was no violence at all. And, and, and so, you know, in, in other words, the, 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 the bar had already, the line had already been crossed five years earlier. So I think the, the thinking, rightly or wrongly, on the part of the government is, let's nip this in the bud early and show them we mean business early. And they don't think they made that calculation, right? That if they did that, there would be a lot of resentment for the violence. And it became almost literally an eye for an eye because there was this young lady who, his eyesight was uh, uh, impaired because of uh, a beanbag round that hit her eye or something that hit her eye. And then for, for a long time, protesters were covering their eyes to say that, you know, and that they would go to posters of the chief executive and cross out her eye, right? And it, I mean, literally, eye for an eye in terms of the motivation. Mm -hmm. I think we would be in a different place if the, if the police were a little, I mean, I think by any measure, the police have been quite restrained. But in this particular case, the response early on was really quite strong. Mm -hmm. What would need to be offered by the chief executive to really bring the protest to an end? What sort of concessions would now be necessary to be made? So there are five demands, and the protest slogan is five demands, not one less. Now, I always kind of mess this up. So um, one is the withdrawal of the extradition amendment bill, and that's already been done. Yeah. Second is uh, the granting of the... Uh, the, the um, withdrawal of uh, labeling uh, the protests as riots. And that's important because if a protester gets charged and con convicted of rioting, then that's like a 10-year sentence, 10-year plus, uh, rather than you know, if, you're, if you're doing some kind of a lesser charge. Um, then there's uh, the demand for an independent commission of inquiry into police violence. Then there's uh, the other demand is amnesty for all protesters who've been arrested. And then the f final uh, one is um, universal, uh, direct, universal suffrage direct election of the chief executive and the legislature, which again is a huge political reform that is unlikely to be granted in such a short time uh, uh, in, 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 in a comprehensive manner. And that really is a matter for Beijing, really, than anything else. So. Uh, most people tend to focus now on this question of an independent commission of inquiry into police violence. And people wonder, well, why can't the, the, the government just agree to that? And I would kind of agree that we're past the point of the arguments that people put up for not doing it. Among the arguments is that it would be a fool's errand to do it because uh, you have an inquiry like that, it will never satisfy everybody. It will be, it will always dissatisfy somebody. And so who would even take on this job of managing this independent commission? But I think we're kind of beyond that, that there would be a huge amount of symbolism and having uh, usefulness and having this independent commission. Politically for the government, they would have to make it an independent commission to investigate violence by the police and the protesters. I don't think they could just do it about police violence. Um, there would have to be some kind of mm -hmm. nod to the importance of the police in, in our community. And it's too late to resurrect that uh, reform package which you mentioned in your talk, or something similar? I don't think it's too late, and this is what I hope, is that you know, there is some talk about it, but you know, Beijing works in mysterious ways. And, and this is one of the problems, I think, 
in Hong Kong is that one of the factors, in fact, probably the most important factor in all of this, what Beijing thinks and what is the relationship and the, what, what is being communicated between the Hong Kong government and the Beijing government, it's all opaque. We don't know. We don't know the same. I mean, the, I, I'm not even sure the chief executive of Hong Kong even knows what Xi Jinping truly thinks, right? And um, it, 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 so, well, she's had, she's had meetings. I mean, at one point, uh, it was thought that she would be out by February. Uh, the Financial Times had this story that the government, the Beijing government, had decided to dump her uh, by February. Uh, and I think that that was probably a story leaked from Beijing itself. Uh, and then there was you know, gaze the reaction. And then uh, all of a sudden, a couple weeks later, she appeared with Xi Jinping in Shanghai. He took uh, time off from his schedule uh, at a, a big um, trade fair and uh, met with her and indicated his uh, support. So it looks like she will remain for the rest of her term. I, you know, I think one thing has to understand about the government and, 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 you know, I'm not saying that the British have a lot to answer for, but the British have a lot to answer they for. Usually, yeah. Yeah. They usually have. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, the people who run Hong Kong are essentially civil servants. This is a civil servant government. Now, I'm a civil servant, so I think maybe I have a little bit of uh, license to, uh, to, 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 to be critical of civil servants. But civil servants are not trained or made to be politicians to respond to, you know, to the pulse of the people, right? They're there to apply process, apply policy, right? Particularly trained in the British system in, in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong government is all about understanding what the sovereign wants, whether it was in London and now in Beijing, and to execute it. It's not about understanding what the people want and being responsive and accountable to the people. That's not part of uh, Terry Lamb's DNA. So I'm not excusing the, the, the lethargy of the Hong Kong government. I'm just saying that that's kind of where they're coming from. And they're not, there's no imagination. There's no, and of course, again, the relationship between Hong Kong and the mainland and Beijing is very opaque. We don't really understand what the Hong Kong government can or cannot do, what the Beijing government wants them to do. What they you know, it, 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 it's not... There are many things, however, I would, I would say this, there are many things that the Hong Kong government can do that's within the powers of their autonomy uh, from Beijing. And I think it's generally accepted that the Hong Kong government in the 20 plus years since the handover has not exercised in full the autonomy that they have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's problematic. Thank you. I went into a Beijing restaurant a few months ago and within two minutes the lady said, of course the Hong Kong protests have been instigated by the British and the Americans. Just look at the British and American flags being displayed. So what is the Western influence? This is a very good question because I don't think anyone knows definitively. Um, let's not be naive in the sense that if we live in an age where countries, and, 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 and you may notice this has been happening for a long, long time, where other countries interfere and meddle in other countries' affairs. I mean, you, you, in the United States, you're struggling with this issue uh, today. Uh, you know, who, is there interference in meddling in the election? I thought only Russia would do that. Oh, right, yes, <laughs> well, you know. Uh, and there, I mean, I'm not saying quid pro quos or anything like that, but. But, you know, I think it would be naive to think that there isn't, particularly the, the funding issue. Uh, this is another disappointment that I have with the media. They, there have been stories about where the funding comes for the uh, protests. And generally the stories have said, oh, it's the um, Hong Kong people who give little bits of money here and there, and uh, old ladies who come and bring food, and. You know, again, let's not be naive about uh, about things. Now, again, I have no evidence, so I'm not. You know, I'm just saying that, uh, and, and I, uh, you know, whether it's a national institute for democracy or whatever, I don't know. In some ways, I think it's irrelevant because whether uh, they're getting aid from whatever source overseas or black hands here, black hands there, I, 
you know, I, I'm sure Beijing is, is trying to influence people, Taiwan is trying to influence people, the Americans, the British, uh, all sorts of people are working. I don't think it matters. I think what matters is the fact that clearly the people of Hong Kong are dissatisfied with the way things are, uh, particularly our young people. And, you know, it's hard to blame the young people for a system that people my age and older created. I mean, we cherish. We need to understand what it is that, they, that they're concerned about. And I think we, uh, what I really, uh, the beef I have in particular with the coverage is that the coverage, the media coverage tends to focus on the, on the valiance. You know, how valiant and how brave and how, you know, oh, democracy icons. Yes, 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 we're all for democracy, but what deeper is, where is, this, where is that dissatisfaction? And I think it, it lies where I was trying to, what I was talking about in identity and the fear, the fear that of the mainland and the mainlanders that's born out of a lack of confidence in a very complex world. In a, in a world where young people feel like their opportunities are narrowing. I used to teach a course, a uh, leadership development program for international business and global management students, where we, at the, it, it's the last semester of their last year uh, in university. At the beginning of the semester, I would ask, at the, you know, when I first started teaching, this is you know, 12 years ago, I would ask, how many of you have job offers already, or have secured a job? Almost all of the 30, 40 young people would raise their hands beginning of the semester. The last few years uh, that I was teaching the same course, asked the same question, only two or three would say that. So clearly, you know, with the job market tightening, more mainlanders in Hong Kong, more competition, and the mainland talent pool is huge. Uh, you know, it's, it's no wonder that there's that lack of confidence and worry about the future. No, I, I'm not doubting that at all, but is there evidence that the British and American or Taiwanese governments, governments, not uh, private institutions, are actively involved? I, I haven't seen it. I don't know of any hard evidence, so I can't say anything for sure. No, mm -hmm. I will just, no. I okay, let me ask you something about China. There's a lot of talk that the Chinese will run out of patience and will use troops resort to a Tiananmen Square, to a military solution. What do you think the likelihood of that is? I think it's un highly unlikely, and for a number of reasons. I, I think there's been a lot of geopolitical coverage for the protests already, cover, sorry, for the, uh, for, 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 for the protests. We had um, uh, October 1, the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China, uh, China didn't want to do anything, wouldn't want to do anything before then. We had the district council elections that I talked about in November. We have the Taiwan elections, which uh, look like the pro-independence uh, TPP. The incumbent, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, is looks set to win, and the, the Beijing would prefer that uh, she not win. Um, and I think even looking f further uh, in the future, the, the Winter Olympics in 2022, uh, I, I, it's not too far away, and the Winter Olympics are not the Summer Olympics, but I, I don't think Beijing would want to be an international doghouse. It would, I mean, if you do something in Hong Kong that's violent, at Tiananmen 2.0, you'll be in the doghouse for a while, more than likely. And, and I don't think that that's... And, 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 and this is not the China of 1989. Um, this is a more sophisticated um, uh, state now. They're brutal. State for sure, and they, one shouldn't excuse any of the brutality that they, uh, you know, the Uyghurs and all that. I mean, the, the, those are real issues, and uh, that should be of concern to everybody. Uh, so we we shouldn't be cavalier about the possibility of a military crackdown, in, you know, a Tiananmen style military <coughs> crackdown. But I personally don't think it will happen. I don't think it will happen. But isn't Xi Jinping uh, quite under pressure? There is still the continuing trade war a slumping, yeah. or at least deteriorating yeah. the Chinese war. economy. Yeah. There is the uh, situation in Xinjiang. There is Hong Kong and quite a few other problems. So isn't there a lot of pressure on Xi Jinping to do something about at least one or two of these major problems? <coughs> 
I think there is, and there's more pushback on Xi Jinping than probably we know. Um, I would just say this, and I, again, I'm probably uh, avoiding <laughs> answering your question directly. You should be a diplomat. <laughs> You're really a diplomat. <laughs> is, uh, is this, is that, you know, whatever people say about the importance or unimportance of Hong Kong to China today, uh, there are those who, who remark, oh, Hong Kong is no longer the accounts for as, as large a percentage of China's GDP as it used to. Uh, but no kidding, uh, the, the, the Chinese pie is so much bigger nowadays than, than it used to be. So of course the percentage is more. But when you look at the many things that Hong Kong has done for China and continues to do, it's still a very important part of the Chinese economy and very important to China. In financial services alone, don't kid me about saying that Shanghai is going to replace uh, Hong Kong. It's not. Nowhere near. The rule of law alone, but also just the sheer numbers. I mean, you just look at the numbers. You've got to be numbers people. The, 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 uh, Hong Kong by far, just like the bond issues alone, I mean, it's, just, it's by far more important. And in other ways too. One country, two systems is as important to the mainland to preserve as Anybody for anybody else. Hong Kong is unique in the world as a place where data flows from the West mixed with data flows from China. Nowhere else in the world does this happen because of concern about data st uh, standards, uh, management standards in the mainland. If one country, two systems is broken and say the United States withdraws recognition of China's, um, of, of the United States uh, um, recognition of Hong Kong's special status, that disappears. Um, the um, uh, security and intelligence exchange between Hong Kong and the United States, for example, on pre-clearance of container traffic from Hong Kong to um, the United States, that would disappear. So, uh, you know, China wants one country, two systems uh, to continue. I think the difference is that they have a thin concept of one country, two systems. A concept of one country, two systems that doesn't include human rights and fairness and justice. It's a thin concept, like a thin concept of the rule of law. Whereas the pro-democracy forces think of a thick concept of, the, uh, of one country, two systems, where you know, the human rights and, 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 and uh, rule of law is all sort of wrapped into that. I'm not saying one, you know, China's view is, uh, is morally corrupt or anything like that. I'm just saying that that's a different perspective of what one country should, uh, two systems should be. Thank you. Is it still good fun to live in Hong Kong? It's more stressful, <laughs> but yeah. Um, it's nice that the cold weather has arrived because it, it was somewhat difficult uh, when you go to these protests and not only do you, you know, you, you see all the tension and all the, uh, the concern and all the rushing around, but then you had the heat and humidity as well, which really played into the year of living dangerously theme kind of thing, you know. Uh, but no, no Sigourney Weavers around. I, 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 um, so it's easier to protest now, you say? It's easier to be out there for a long period of time and to wander around. I don't mean to be flippant about it, but... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it is, I was telling uh, kind of, uh, earlier that uh, the, the, in some ways, and again, I don't mean to be flippant about anything of this, but the hardest part of the day for, for me, and I know for many of my colleagues, is when we finish work and want to go home or want to do something in the evening. You have to have a kind of exit strategy for the evening. You know, where are you going? Is the MTR running? Uh, if there's a protest that crops up at where you're going, how will you get home, and all that sort of thing, uh, you know. Which, again, uh, uh, as the protesters say, small price to pay for democracy. And uh, I would agree, I would agree. So, you know, but, but again, Hong Kong is a more uh, stressful place than it, I mean, you might think that Hong Kong is always a stressful place. But I actually, what I like about Hong Kong is that you can actually live a kind of even, 
keeled life there, even though the pay, you can live a very fast-paced life as well. Sounds like Chapel Hill. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Let's open it to questions on the audience. This gentleman here in the white shirt. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I was amazed to hear that the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing sincerely believed that the establishment parties would win an overwhelming victory in those district council elections. And just the opposite happened. Yes. Speak to me about the, the, at the very top in China, are they getting real intelligence about what's happening on the street in Hong Kong? I think this is a very good question. Because uh, the mainland does have a, what's called a liaison office. In fact, the liaison office is right near right there. And that's a target of the protest that has been. And supposedly they're there to be the eyes and ears of Beijing. And, and there's also a foreign ministry office as well. And of course, the Hong Kong government is meant to be, you know, the, our, our, the officials, including the chief executive, do these duty visits to Beijing all the time. And what are, so that's why I'm saying it, it's rather opaque, right? Now, I would turn the, your question a little bit uh, upside down and to say, like, that is a story that's coming out that they were caught by surprise, right? Now, again, the opacity of, of, of the time going. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure they are really caught off guard by this. They may have been caught off guard by the real 180-degree turn in terms of 75% uh, seats held by independents and pro-China parties to complete opposite of that, about the same percentage being now held by pro-democracy forces. Why were the, I think it's an important question to ask, like why were you know, pro-democracy, pro-China and uh, independents holding that number of seats? It's because at district level, those guys were doing their jobs, were looking after the district. They weren't distracted by saying China does this, China does that, China does this. They were actually looking after the environment, the street sweeping, the clean, cleaning the, the trees. Uh, and now that you have all these young people, admirable that all these young people have, have stepped up and have taken the seats, I do hope that this is, could be an opening for, again, d uh, discussion and conversation. Uh, I hope they actually do their jobs in the district and don't just sort of rail against China, seeing their job is to rail against China, that they engage people in their districts and, and, and have a conversation with them about the way forward for Hong Kong. It's an opportunity. Now, again, I'm sorry I, I probably didn't answer your question, but I, 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 I'm not so sure they were that surprised. Yeah. Okay, thank you, this gentleman here. It's a challenge. Uh, 
But um, I've, I've seen it in the classroom where um, you would see, particularly in classrooms where you want to have collaborative work all the time, uh, it would be very difficult to get Hong Kong students to work with mainland students. Um, I forced it. I would choose groups to work together at random and would just force it because I felt it was important to do so. And I, I would say in the 10 years that I was teaching that I did see better cooperation from, between Hong Kong students and mainland students. I had a student who was in my leadership class. She got a degree in international business global management. And she graduated, got a job in, um, uh, at an accounting firm, major accounting firm. And she got hit by a truck and, 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 and died. And that made news. And when it made news on social media, there were more than a few people who were saying good riddance you took a job from Hong Kong people. But the, so, so it exists. And, and it, 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 it's cultural. It's also, I suppose, it also about opportunity. It's, it's, I, I guess it even goes into, in terms of the way people shop. So, so what, one of the things I was trying to understand is why there, were, there was a focus of protests in areas around the border with, with the mainland. What was sort of the concern there? And it was that uh, I asked a number of my students who live in that area that over the years they've seen the, the kinds of shops that they have in their neighborhoods turn from the ma and pa stores into jewelry stores, uh, stores selling um, things that mainlanders want, uh, such as baby formula, uh, diapers, things like that, um, and, and not shops that cater to Hong Kong people. And you know, in some ways, not not not, not a racist thing, not a not, not a cultural thing, but as much as like we we live here, you should be you know the government and and, and, and we should have the shops we want. I mean, that's just a simple like anti-immigration. Yes. So so exactly. So could we say it's actually populism in Hong Kong? Would be a well, no, you know, I mean, it, it, it it's populism uh, to, to an extent, but again. Uh, I think it's a kind of populism that a any of us would feel, right? Uh, but, it, some, it, but it manifests itself in, in some kind of irrationality. So I have experienced where I've been beaten up because people that beat me up thought that I was from the mainland. Because I, I went to my building and I was followed by these people and I confronted them and said, you, you can't just enter the building, you have to sign for security and our security was out to lunch, I mean literally out to lunch. And then, and then, I, and then they, I said this in Cantonese, and my Cantonese is really <coughs> kind of bad. And, and, and they beat me up. The police, they investigated, they believed that I was beaten up because the people who beat me up thought that I was from the mainland because my Cantonese was bad. And, and so, so again, it is there. I agree with you, I'm not sure what you do about it. Aside from getting young people together and mixing them up and hoping that things would get better. I mean, in some ways, it's the Singapore solution. It's the housing estates where you mix all the races in and you, know, you don't create ghettos, if you will, right? And you just let pe get people to work uh, together, live together, and learn from each other. And there's not enough of that done, uh, even in the university. And I think that's where it should be starting, in the schools. And we don't do enough of that. And we don't talk enough about it. Thank you. Um, yes, this gentleman here. Hey, Alan. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned earlier that um, you, know, you proposed these uh, listening sessions between administration and uh, the protesters. Now, Hasn't the hasn't Carrie Lam done the same thing? Um, but to very, uh, I mean, how how different is that from what Carrie Lam has done, which has been met with uh, much derision? And uh, I mean, what where how, where do you see your proposal being different? Well, I mean, it's, what we're doing is not a proposal; and it's not an alternative. I'm just saying that um, 
From my view, with the chips down the way they are, I argue, and many friends of mine and colleagues of mine argue, that we just have to do what we can. Everybody's got to do what they can. And from our perspective, what I know and what many of friends of mine know is how to convene people and bring people together in conversations. Everybody knows how to talk. So you just got to bring people together. What, what the government has done is, is to have a very public uh, engagement session, right, where you people, citizens will sign up and they get chosen by lottery and it's all set piece, uh, public and, you know. I, I'm not sure that's going to be very effective. The first one wasn't all that effective mo by most accounts. Um, I, I think that they should just be, you know, low-key, keep the media out, just have citizens talking with the government in a frank and cordial way. Um, and that's kind of what we're trying to do in the university, in the residential college where I live, just, you know, invite people to come. So we did a, a session, for example, we, we try to theme them because, you know, part of the Sorry, the Trumpiness of the protests is that, you know, I think that part of the, the reason why it, is, is there's a lot of misunderstanding of, of Hong Kong history, of Chinese history, and, and, and a lot of the young people are just low information voters. They, they're not well informed. They didn't get it in school, and again, can't blame them in many ways for it. So what we do is theme our sessions. So we did one on Hong Kong's role in the world to get young people to sort of understand that, you know, Hong Kong is a creation of, in some ways, of, of the Communist Party of China because they won in 49 and the nationalists lost. So all these folks came to Hong Kong to, to seek refuge. If it weren't, you know, if, if the nationalists won, I don't, you know, I think about it. Um, but anyway, um, I, it, it's just a matter of, of, of getting um, you know, people to, to communicate. And that's where it's a bit different. I think the government wants to do, be seen to do something, but can't. Uh, and I think that people, regular people, can do things that I think would be more effective. One problem is that we shouldn't use this idea that the movement is leaderless as an excuse not to have this kind of communication. Thank you. Um, Yes, this gentleman here. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, I don't understand day one. Is the chief executive stupid or naive? I mean, if you do what the chief executive did, one would expect the response that one got. And so I don't understand what they were trying to accomplish initially. And I presume they had this with the backing of the Chinese government, although you're now suggesting maybe not. But I don't know what they thought the outcome was going to be other than what it was. If you're talking in terms of day one as being just the idea of introducing the legislation yes. for the extradition, you know, you know, by most accounts, and I've gone into this with, with advisors to the chief executive, um, was it Beijing telling her to do this, or did she do it? My understanding, and I believe this to be true, and I know many others who have told me as much, is that it was really a Hong Kong-grown initiative, a Hong Kong government initiative, because the chief executive felt that it would be a small step towards what's called Article 23 legislation. This is Article 23 is uh, the ar article in the basic law that would deal with what is treason, what is uh, you know, um, uh, espionage and things like that, it's, uh, crimes against the state, and um, uh, security laws, and internal security laws. And um, sh initially the government had tried to uh, uh, bring in Article 23 legislation in 2003, and that was a complete failure, and it led to the resignation of, of the chief executive of that time, the first chief executive of Hong Kong in his second term. And um, uh, so I think that Carrie Lam, the chief executive, felt that this was something that she could do, and it happened, by happenstance, there was a, a case of a Hong Kong person accused in Taiwan of killing his girlfriend, and he had fled to Hong Kong. And this gave an opportunity, an opening, for the government to say, huh, 
we can introduce this um, amendment to the fugitives ordinance, extradition of fugitives ordinance, and that will get us a little bit of the way uh, towards Article 23 legislation. It will also be uh, um, uh, uh, brownie points with Bates and it totally backfired. And whether they should have known better, it's watering the bridge, but they didn't. And, it was, and you know, it was not so much that they did it, though. I would say the biggest sin was to try to push it through so quickly. But she has clearly failed. So why hasn't she been replaced? That wouldn't be necessarily such a humiliation of China, would it be? Well, you know, uh, with the first chief executive of Hong Kong, it took some time before he was actually replaced uh, midterm. I mean, he had the big failure of the Article 23 legislation, but he wasn't replaced immediately. So this is kind of par for the course. And, you know, it's a, it's a matter of, uh, I guess, Beijing, you know, Beijing, I mean, I hate to fall on the whole old saving face notion, but, but, you know, you don't want to say, oh, right, we made a mistake, she's out. I mean, you know. I mean, it's not so much for her as to think that like Beijing uh, didn't make an error or what have you, or you know, this is, it's, it's, it, it, I think it's, I still think it's a matter of time before she moves on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, over there, right to the end here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, in the fall of 2018, I studied abroad at HKU in the faculty of uh, public, uh, political science and public administration. Oh, right. Yeah, so this was a fascinating talk. Thank you. Uh, my question is, why haven't we seen similar episodes of unrest in Macau as we're seeing in Hong Kong right now? That's a good question. Macau is a different kind of a fish. I mean, it's smaller. I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more compliant. I mean, the, the sense that the pro-democracy movement isn't as sort of heated as it has traditionally been in Hong Kong. Uh, there is, um, yeah, for, for various sort of uh, reasons that um, uh, th there's less concern about the mainland and interference in Macau in general. And, and, and look, uh, the, the biggest industry there is the gambling lives and dies by the mainland gamblers. So if those get shut off, it's worse than shutting off the water. So, I mean, think about it. Uh, you know, already just by shutting off the high rollers a few years ago when Xi Jinping was uh, on his anti-corruption drive, that really dried up the, the, uh, the gambling and the gaming industry in, in, in the house. So they're not as diversified in, in many ways, and, and they don't play as much of an international role. So for, for all those various reasons, it's just a, a lot calmer over there. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, please. Um, in listening to the story that you told us, I'm just struck by the position of um, the young Hong Kong protesters. I'm, I'm sad to hear that they have to um, be so, feel that they have to be so unified and are not, in, not allowing for plurality of opinion. And I, I have heard a little bit of BBC reports along these lines, but I also feel for them because just think about it, it's so, it's so amorphous. You know, it's one country, two systems, or whatever, and then there's the opacity of what their government, and then China, and then it's just so opaque. And I think that in, and then you know their identity. So in those, in that situation, it is there is a tendency I think to then want to, you know, say okay, then we are going to also have to respond in this kind of very hard way. And, and, and that's a question I put to my students and say, you know, I I grew up. In Marcus's Philippines. So what these kids are doing now, we could not be. If we did any of what the uh, uh, these kids are doing, you're, you're silenced, you're jailed, you're exiled, and you're killed. And so I put it to my students and like, you ain't seen nothing. And if you continue down this path, you might see what my family and myself and my friends had to deal with when we were growing up. And do you want that? And, and they don't really have a good answer for that. But in large part, I think it's, uh, it's because there is this, what they feel is some, some kind of desperation. Now, we have to just remember, these are young people. They're not mature people who are thinking in ways that maybe we do. I mean, I'm reminded constantly in my interaction with students that I'm old. 
uh, you know, and, and getting older. As I used to say, I get older, my students stay the same age. <laughs> Every year, the students are the same age that I get older. So I had to start explaining what the Soviet Union is and what Margaret Th who Margaret Thatcher was and all that sort of thing. So, so yeah, I mean, one area that you touch upon somewhat there is the mental health issue. And I think this is important. And we, and another story within you know, Hong Kong U was that we sent out mental health people, professionals, to talk to the students. And we had one from my institute who's from Africa, happened to be in Hong Kong as one of our fellows who's a conflict prevention expert and mental health specialist. We had him talk to all these uh, protesters and gather information from them. And by and large, you know, they were sleep deprived, they weren't eating enough, they had almost all of them broken with their families. Some of them, their families didn't even know they were protesting. And the stresses of that alone make you want, make you take decisions that are not logical or rational and, and, and you take a course, you, you, you put yourself in a situation of desperation that maybe if, if, if you stopped and thought about it, it, it's not as desperate. And also there's a lot of the apocalyptic language that's used, that we live in a totalitarian state, we live in a Chinazi state. We live in, you know, that, that, that there are no more freedoms in Hong Kong. There's no uh, autonomy at all in Hong Kong, which, you know, I can tell you is, is, is totally false, this kind of apocalyptic language that we hear from some of the celebrity pro-democracy activists. And I'm not going to say it's irresponsible, but I'm going to say it's irresponsible uh, to, for them to, to, to say that. And, and, you know, but they have congressmen in the United States come, you know, eating out of their hands when they say, um, you know, it's a police state, China, and China and, 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 it, and it results in things like the U.S. Human Rights and Democracy Act, which I don't know if any people here support. I, 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 I came in October to give talks like this because I felt it was necessary to explain that this could do more harm to the young people than help them. Uh, and I think still that that will happen. Thank you. How, how important is Joshua Wong, who is the best known of the uh, protesters in the West? He's important to the U.S. media. Oh. But not to the people I don't think he's that important, to be honest, to the protesters in the street. When you watch him, no, he's not. He's a global thinker, according to Foreign Policy magazine. I <laughs> uh, The gentleman over there to the left. <coughs> People on, uh, toward the end of the room are uh, also welcome to ask questions. <laughs> Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I guess I, I'm personally amazed that you talk about the 75% pro China and independence and now the switch over. Uh, and it gets uh, sort of wonder, I wonder, uh, what kind of electorate do you have in Hong Kong uh, in terms of to have that kind of a switch uh, in, in loyalties? And, and gets at, uh, can you characterize the electorate in terms, and especially characterize what you call the independence? How big a block is that? Yes. We are hoping for that switch in the US, don't we? This is a good question. Uh, this is a good question. And, and, and the reason why you, have, you could have that kind of shift is because the percentage of people voting in regular times uh, was about 43% at best, usually. For district councils, possibly even lower. Um, to, it was 70-something percent. So that's what happened, is that and, and, and frankly, I'm, I've been chastising friends of mine, as I do chastise American friends of mine when they don't vote, believe me. A lot of my friends have a lot to ask for for not voting in 2016. Uh, anyway, I tell them, like, all of a sudden, you guys have discovered voting, right? Where have you been? You know, people, old people like me, we go out and vote, and right? even in district council elections. I'm so happy to be able to vote in Hong Kong because for a while, I couldn't even vote in Canada because Canada didn't have a, a, a overseas or absentee balloting. So it was so precious to me uh, to be able to vote in Hong Kong. 
And, and that's where the change is. Now, independence is a bit code word for, typically most of them are like pro-China folks. But let me just tell you about my district. My district, you know, the, the, the guy was an independent, but probably a, a pro-China person, elderly. Well, sorry, I shouldn't say that. You know, elderly, you know, I mean, I'm talking about somebody who's probably in his late 60s or so. So that's not, <laughs> late 60s is the new 30s, right? I mean, so, but, anyway, but he did his job. That's why he was getting uh, uh, reelected all the time. Because, you know, when, when, when trees would fall, he would have warning, M O U R N I N G, ceremonies for the trees. He was looking after the street. You'd see him every day on the street. He was a district council like no other district council. He lost by 200 votes. Oh. I felt badly. And that's why I hope that you know, the young people, the pro-democracy people who have taken over, that they understand that the district councils are not just about railing against China and that they don't now have license to just spend their time railing against the mainland. That what the job is about the district and connecting, and there's an opportunity there, right? And I think that I hope many of them do take an opportunity to get really engaged in their districts and build democracy from the ground up like it's supposed to be. Thank you. Do I see someone at the back of the... Okay, this gentleman here. <coughs> yeah, to here, there. No, no, towards the, in the middle of the room there. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, could you talk more about uh, political power? Uh, so in a way, this movement is a movement of the powerless. And you mentioned the economic power aspects of uh, nativism in Hong Kong. You would. I would prefer localism, but you know, whatever. Uh, but so if we talk about political power, this is where I think a parallel breaks down between the US and Hong Kong. These people, even though they're the majority and they live in Hong Kong, they do not have political power, whether they flip uh, the district councils from 75% pro-China to 75% pro-independent, that's a minuscule fraction of the chief executive electoral college. Uh, so yeah, could you just talk more about that, how that affects any of the calculations here? Because even though this is not a full totalitarian state, we do have that aspect of people not having political power. You're perfectly sensible. I, I think that that's right. And localism, nativism, sorry. You know, I, I go with one term. Um, Can you put some mic? Yeah, I, I would say that you're right because the political system that we had in Hong Kong doesn't allow for people to suddenly say, we don't like what's going on, we're going to vote the bums out, right? Or we're going to get our representatives to vote against the government in a major bill and that would collapse the government, like in a parliamentary system, and then we would have an election. It can't happen, right? And so the political power is decidedly among the elites and, and resides really with pro Beijing folks. The legislature is about, you know, half of the legislature is uh, directly elected. Uh, most of the other half is like functional constituencies, representatives of industry. Not all of them are, of course, pro Beijing, but Essentially, the legislature is controlled by project Beijing forces. Uh, that's improved significantly, and you know, uh, now that you have district council, the district councilors will make up a certain number of uh, uh, members of the legislature. So I, I, I would agree that you know, when you're talking about raw political power and who controls what and the levers of power, that for sure many of these things, including the victory of the pro-democracy forces in the, in the district councils, I mean, not all that much. And at the moment, we continue to wait for the government right, to act and the government to do things and the government to feel the pressure. And somehow, they don't feel the pressure at all. It doesn't seem that way, and it's frustrating. But there lies the, 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 the problem with Hong Kong is that uh, you know people can be on the streets in the numbers that they are, and it looks like the government is just immovable. And how do you change that? I really don't. And uh, all I can say is, I what protesters, students of mine say is, you go tell the government that you want change, you want an independent commission. And I, I mean, yeah, I get it. So I mean, that I and my friends of more influence than the young people on the streets that we should be out there telling the government what to do. And you know, I'm not without 
I, I don't have Carrie Lamb's phone number, but I mean, you, you know, should, you should. I, I, I encounter her every now and then. But but there we go. I mean, um, I think that that should happen, and the more the people do it, the better. And it's happening. But is the government responding? It's frustrating, but I don't see it yet. Thank you. We are working you very hard. Perhaps we have two more questions, and then we'll uh, call it a night. Here's the gentleman who would like to ask a question. You mentioned earlier the importance of the Chinese identity rather than uh, underlying political beliefs. Um, is democracy inconsistent with the Chinese identity? So I was talking about the Hong Kong identity. In terms of Hong Kong, okay, which, which is part of the issue, right? In terms of Hong Kong's identity and the values that are considered to be Hong Kong values, and 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 wrapped up in those Hong Kong values is uh, adherence to the rule of law, at least from the Hong Kong perspective, because possibly the what we call sort of the jewel in the crown of Hong Kong's unique system within China is that we have the rule of law. Just last week, I had. Uh, and lunch with uh, the former Chief Justice of Canada who is uh, in Hong Kong because she is now sitting, right as we speak, her first sitting as a non-permanent judge on Hong Kong's Court of Final Appeal. Right? Now it might surprise you that you can have a foreign judge sitting on Hong Kong's highest court, but there is a list of foreign judges, eminent judges from other common law jurisdictions who are sitting listen to uh, court of final appeal cases. The actual president of, the sitting president of the UK Supreme Court is also, uh, she and the, our, our Canadian Chief Justice are the first two women to, to be uh, on the court of final appeal. So in the Hong Kong identity, I think the, the concern for the rule of law and the desire to preserve the rule of law is wrapped up in those values. Now, if you're asking about China and the Chinese, uh, you know, I can only say that I, I know many, I mean, you go to Taiwan, there's a little low there, I mean, you go to uh, many places, that, I don't know, Singapore is a huge uh, Taiwan, I mean, whatever one quibbles with the People's Action Party in Singapore, that they have a function judiciary, is it possible? And also I won't sell uh, mainland short. I mean, you know, sometimes we look at China and we take a snapshot and we live with that snapshot for years and years and years. And we don't look at China the movie. We should stop looking at China the snapshot and look at China the movie. And the China the movie is whatever the people tell you in this country, that there are changes happening in China in terms of the rule of law, in terms of freedom of worship, in terms of many of the freedoms that we in this country and other countries in Canada that we pride. <coughs> you know, when I go, and I, I know this might be sort of shocking, uh, again, I don't mean to be flippant, but every time I'm in China on a Sunday, I, I go to church, and it's packed. I have to go an hour early just to sit down, to get a seat. And, 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 and yes, I get that it's a state patriotic church that's, you know, but now that you have recognition of Vatican and uh, an agreement in terms of appointment of bishops. Uh, you know, I've been to both the underground church and the official state church. I don't see much difference from either. I mean, it was a, you got a bit of a free song doing something dangerous by going to the underground church. And I, again, I don't mean to be flippant about these things, but there are changes happening in China. It's not just still and static. Now, I get that we have Xi Jinping was supposed to be rolling back many things and rights and all of that sort of thing. Yes, that, that's happening in many quarters and we should be very, very concerned. Particularly, again, I stress on the weaker issue. This is a very, very important issue that requires the attention of every human being on the planet. But I think that, you know, to say that rule of law or that, uh, you know, is, is somehow incompatible with and society identity, I'm not comfortable with that. I, I wouldn't agree. I think it is possible, yeah. Is, is China just too large to be ruled democratically? Mainland China? That's a good question. I don't think I can give you an adequate answer. I think that um, I would just tell you a story that when I asked uh, one of the Hong Kong tycoons about this, 
um, his answer was this. And he's a devout uh, Methodist. He said, every day I wake up in the morning and I get down on my knees and I thank God that the Communist Party of China is still in charge because the alternative is too horrible to contemplate. To contemplate. This is one point of view. Thank you. Can you briefly, before we uh, leave for tonight, briefly tell us about the effect of the Hong Kong events on Taiwan? This is a really good question. So, I think you guys should really focus on the Taiwan election in January. Taiwan politics is so fascinating in any case, but I mean, this time will be quite fascinating. So, um, before all the protests were going, that the incumbent, Taiwan, she was running behind. She was looking to fail. And then, all of a sudden, by July, I think, she was 21 points up in the polls. I mean, and, and still looks pretty good. So, um, you know, one country, two systems is constituted for Hong Kong <coughs> has never really been acceptable to the people in Taiwan. And it can't work. There has to be much more of um, one country, two systems than what we have in Hong Kong. The model in Hong Kong we just won't work for Taiwan people. So. Uh, we have to examine that, and you know what's happened in Hong Kong is certainly affecting um, the way the Taiwan people are going to vote in January, and we have to be, however, uh, we have to be concerned because the way the geopolitics of the world are going today, with the kind of unpredictable leadership we now have in the United States of America for good or ill, this provides opportunities for other countries, China included, to potentially do things that they might not do if the United States were more predictable. Am I being diplomatic enough? <laughs> um, Too diplomatic. I, I, I think that this is, this is a big concern. Is it, I mean, Look, it, when I was two years just running uh, Canada's um, Asia-Pacific foreign policy, I went to um, Washington on duty visits to talk, to talk to our counterparts. Susan Thornton, who's spoken here before, she, my boss and myself, we were together, her counterpart uh, in Canada. But when I would go down for duty visits, it's like there's nobody at home. I mean, you go, nobody appointed yet. Uh, Susan Thornton was in, then she was out. She was sacked, and there was nobody in and, and, and for almost two years. And then you go to the White House, and again, there's nobody at home. So who, who, who's, who's in charge, or who's making policy? Is it, do we just watch the tweets? Uh, the only kind of, sorry, I'm being maybe too frank. Yeah. But the only Not at all. The only, the only We're same, just among us here. The only same place to go was the Senate Foreign Relations Committee because there were same people working there. Policy sanity still reigned there. And I, I call your attention to one bit of legislation that nobody noticed uh, that President Trump signed in December, end of December last year. It's called the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, ARIA, so, so nicely named, A-R-I-A. And you know, people are concerned. Like you know, what, what we wanted to know what what that was all about, and we thought it was possibly an articulation of a new Trump doctrine to contain China or something like that. So I went over and asked, "Well, oh, what's going on?" You know, uh, and um, the folks, the Senate Relations, the Foreign Relations Committee, told me, "Oh, don't worry about it. It's all in the title. We just want to reassure allies." in Asia that we got their back despite what might be happening down on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. And so in this kind of unpredictable world, you know, Taiwan could be thrown out thrown under the bus. Uh, you know, at one time uh, the president was, or the president elect was speaking to Taiwan on the phone. Who knows, right? And then this is a problem, I think. And uh, but so but we should be watching because the kind of unpredictable leadership you get now in the United States could lead China, potentially, to do something on Taiwan that they, I hate to say it, put it this way, but they might think they could get away with uh, 
if they did it before more rational leadership came into the office. I think we know what you mean. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. It's been very enlightening in the evening. Thank you for coming here on the Sunday days. And thank you for coming here tonight on this rainy evening. Our next session is on the 6th of January. And in the meantime, happy holiday. See you again soon. Happy holiday.